Well, I'm going to give the overview of a, a, a holistic um, ecological restoration project, and Sue's going to talk um, about the weed eradication project, so 10 years on. So um, it's a terrestrial talk. We're surrounded by ocean, which gives us opportunities that just aren't uh, most ecological restorationists don't get. We aim for eradication. OK, where are we? About 750 kilometres northeast of Sydney, um, out in the middle of the drink. It's quite a small site, it's only 1,455 hectares. 75% of it's protected in a national park. We call it a permanent park preserve because we're very special. Um, so it's that outline in the orange there. Um, we've got a resident population of about 350, tourist bed limit of 400, so there's never more than 1,000 people there. We're governed by our own special act, the Lord Howe Island Act, and um, we're World Heritage listed. It was only discovered in 1788 um, on the way back trying to set up the Norfolk um, Island Penal Colony after Sydney was set up. Um, pigs and goats were introduced soon after for food for whalers and passing vessels. Um, it was first settled in 1834. They brought cats along for some stupid reason. <laughs> then in 1918 there was a shipwreck which brought rats which had a devastating effect. Um, there's been ongoing introduction of pest plant animals since but we're slowing that down now. Interestingly, the whole island was set up as a forest reserve in 1870, um, primarily to protect the Kentia palm industry. Um, so that resulted in there being 87% veg colour. And as I said, 75% is protected. So you look at Lord Howe Island, you think it's pristine. But we've had plenty of extinctions and there's lots of pest problems there. So there's some of the things that um, died out or within five years of rats turning up. And there's our uh, magnificent uh, Lord Howe Phasmid, uh, thought to be extinct for 100 years and um, found uh, uh, on, on that big rock. <laughs> um, and we've got them in captive management at the moment, along with Melbourne Zoo and Stephen Fellenberg, who's here. So with the plants, there's about 240 native plants. About half of those are endemic. So, we, you know, it's pretty special. We've got heaps of introduced plants, over 670, and about 200 of those are invasive, and Sue's going to talk about a project to eradicate 68 species. Pest animals, we've got a fair share of those. Um, we've got five mammals, two of them are already eradicated. Goats nearly eradicated. There's only a few domestic nannies which are getting long in the tooth, um, and they won't be replaced. A um, couple of exotic birds, one targeted for eradication. We've got an exotic frog, a couple of reptiles, Numerous invertebrates, including African big-headed ant, um, which is that picture up there, and we nearly eradicated those. So in, within two years, we'll have them bulb over. And then there's a bunch of other inverts which just affect agriculture. So what are we doing? We're protecting paradise, and it is. It is paradise. Um, our projects, uh, it's, a, it's a, whole, a holistic ecological restoration program, and it's been going for a long time. We're doing um, pest animal and weed eradications and where we can't eradicate, we do control. We're dealing with a plant pathogen. We have one infestation of Phytophthora. Uh, we do a little bit of revegetation. Um, we do a lot of threatened species recovery work um, and we're working to do a lot of reintroduction work down the track. Um, this is all underpinned by research and monitoring, obviously, and education and community engagement, really important. We need to have the community on side. We live and breathe and work with them. You know, we can't get away from them. <laughs> <laughs> um, another thing that's really important is biosecurity. Once you get rid of something, you don't want it coming back in. So we're ramping up our uh, biosecurity. So how do we do it all? How's it all planned? It's, we've got this thing called the Biodiversity Management Plan, and it's a multi-species recovery plan identifies significance, it identifies threats, and it's got a whole bunch of actions. We've also got a really strong legal framework with the Lord Howe Act and the Lord Howe Island regulations. We can send dogs off the island, we can turn, we can, if people bring plants that, that they're not allowed to bring in, we can find them. We've got all sorts of things we can do. We've got a, a control order for African big-headed ants, so if people don't want us on their land poisoning their land, we can just say, no, we're coming and doing it. Noxious Weed Act, um, so we've got, anyway, we've, this document's really good. It helps us get funds um, and, uh, and that, that strong legal framework, really important. What have we done? Well, 80% of those actions in the BMP have uh, been commenced. And if we do the rodent eradication, I think we'll only have a few pages left to implement. Um, we've revised the biosecurity strategy, aligned it to the Act and Regs. 
lots of community awareness. So we do uh, training with the stevedores and with the restaurant restauranteurs. And you can see here, Johnny Trey um, got a green tree frog, poor little thing, um, ended up in the freezer. Um, one of the uh, restauranters heard an Asian house gecko, gave us a call, went down the road, got up, collected it, and it's in the museum now. And then, yeah, significant investment. The program to date, um, about 10 million, and there's 9 million in the um, rodent eradication. So it's a lot of money, but it's, it's worth it. Um, pest animal eradication. So we got rid of pigs in 79, cats 81, to help our jolly little flightless wood hen here. They're flourishing. Feral goat eradication. Um, two weeks, shot 250 goats out, and then we just had the, the domestic herd, which are now slowly dying out. African big headed ants, we've been going for six years on this, and we're really at the. I'll show you um, some maps later on. Uh, Mast owl, beautiful bird. It exterminated the local boo book, um, and we're going to try and get rid of this bird along with the rodents so we can bring back. Book. We also have a rat problem, and so we do a lot of baiting at the moment. And this is just control as opposed to eradication. And we go and people do a lot of trapping around the house. So African big-headed ants, um, 2006. This is what it was like. We the red bits are where we found them and poisoned them. The, the blue bits is where we didn't find them. And this is where we're at now. In April, that was the last remaining infestation, and uh, so we treated it and we just got to monitor it for two years and. We're hoping that they'll be gone. So rodent eradication, very contentious project, but very, very, it's going to kick a lot of gulls. Um, this guy's just having a little sleep on the beach. <laughs> um, we're at the planning and approval stage, so we've got to get all of our approvals through the, uh, the feds and whatever else, and, um, and also um, community engagement. So we're, this fellow here, he's a game changer, this bloke. He's a gun. He goes around and has cups of tea, drinks beer with everyone and he's doing property plans at the individual level. So he's just fighting it property by property. And um, he's getting everyone on side and he's getting a few cheap sausages at the same time. <laughs> if everything goes to plan, the drop will happen in winter 2017. If not, maybe tw uh, 2018. But it's a, it's a really intensive program similar to Macquarie Island. Um, so watch that space. The other thing is, um, we're looking at is getting some sniffer dogs. So when you come, you'll get these little mutts running all over your bag. So don't bring anything over that you're not supposed to. <laughs> Pathogens, I mentioned before, we've got one patch of Phytophthora. Um, we've delimited it, we quarantine it off, and we work it. We, we uh, treat it with fungicide four times a year. Um, we've got boot scrub stations everywhere, so when you come walking on Lord Howe, wash your feet regularly. It's a bit like washing your hands after going to the toilet. Don't be a grub. We're myrtle rust free, so we've prohibited myrtaceous plants and we've got pretty strict plant importation uh, requirements. So we don't want this and um, yeah, we're hoping we can <coughs> keep it that way. But uh, we, we get the Royal Botanical Gardens over every, every second year and they come and do monitoring and so we check and, and Pretty much this Phytophthora uh, infestation's shrinking and we're hoping it'll be gone pretty soon. Um, and obviously, yeah, we need quarantine restrictions and awareness, so we do a lot of training with the community. Reveg, only a little part of our, our work. Um, so we link fragmented vegetation and this one here, reconstructing seabird breeding habitats. Also, we've got an EEC, which we, um, you know, there's only 1% of that left, so we do a little bit of, we try and reconstruct uh, some Sallywood swamp forests every now and then, and we do we stabilise erosion prone areas. The really fun stuff to come down the track is to reintroduce species no longer on the main island, the phasmid there, also the wood roach. Um, and there's, they're out on a little island, they're like 10,000 per hectare, and they just would be a huge food resource for, um, for anything on the island. So, you know, the rats got rid of them quick smart. Um, also, bringing back equi ecological equivalent species like the Tasman parakeet, this one's from Norfolk. That's where we'll, we'll probably steal most of our birds from there. They've got a, a boo book owl, they've got a fantail, and they've got a warbler. So yeah, if we get rid of the rodents, we can bring back all those, those things to, you know, bring back all that functionality into, our, into the ecosystem. I'm gonna pass it over to Sue to give you an update on the weeds.
Great. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having us, team. It's great to uh, get off the rock for a bit. OK, so I'm going to talk about the hard uh, things to eradicate. Hank's talked about all the glamorous pest animal species. They are a bit easier than weeds. Um, a lot of the weeds we're trying to eradicate are fairly widespread, so hence there is a bit of bleed-in time to get to the eradication phase. Um, so pretty much in 2004, the board embarked on an ambitious program to eradicate environmental weeds. Essentially, it's a multi-weed species eradication program, and we're targeting species which, if left to their own devices, would impact the environment. And to give you an understanding of the risk of weeds is that they identified as one of the top three threats to the um, island's environment, so rodents, weeds and plant pathogens, and also climate change, not to forget. And one thing I do like to acknowledge is the uh, earlier work done by the local community, as seen in these images here. Um, very uh, good adherence to PPE on the uh, <laughs> right-hand side there. But pretty much weeds have been part of the awareness of the community for some time. In these images here, they're targeting hot spots, uh, so hence the weed issues did not go away, they were still present, and so we had to ramp it up on the weeds. To achieve weed eradication, you need an all-tenure approach. Fortunately, we have the uh, powers under the New South Wales Noxious Weed Act, so all of our plants are listed as noxious, so we can go on all terrain. Um, just a few here. We do have a lot of um, native plant species from the mainland, which like Lord Howe Island, so sweet potosporum, flame tree, silky oak, just to name a few. And in the sense of why would you consider targeting a weed for eradication, there are a number of criteria. Um, so it is a planned, thought out process. So essentially most of the species that we are targeting have short lived seed banks. They need to be able to respond to treatments. They need to be detectable at all life stages, so from a mature to a juvenile and in all different types of plant communities. Essentially the area that they can expand to or in their invasion range needs to be delimited so you understand where your resources are going. For our widespread species, we're taking that as island scale. And ultimately, to increase the chance or success for eradication, the rate of removal needs to exceed the rate of spread. There's some of the key elements. Initially, we were targeting 25 species. Um, but fortunately, with the update with the uh, Weed Control Order, the Noxious Weed Act, we were able to list additional species. And that's in the vein of early intervention. Why wait for something to go bad when we understand it's either a sleeper weed or it's starting to demonstrate spread locally? So of those extra species, they're quite limited in abundance and hopefully we'll be claiming some eradication outcomes in the near future. Okay, just sort of getting back to the plant maths. maths. Hank sort of mentioned about how um, near half of our um, native plant species are endemic and up to 670 introduced plants have been recorded on the island and of those, 270 have invasive characteristics. We're only targeting 68 introduced plants. I don't know if anyone's been a noxious weed inspector here. People don't really love you. <laughs> but it's just good to have the numbers game to say, hey guys, we're only taking out 68. And the previous uh, weed management strategy from 2006 identified there's likely to be up to 1,000 introduced plants on Lord Howe Island. And I do concur with that. It's just people just love plants. We can't help ourselves. If you're trying to eradicate weeds from an island, how we go about it? Essentially, the island's mapped up into unique landscape units, and these are, are uniquely identified um, on GIS systems and on ground. They are demarked on ground simply by blue marker tape. Short and sweet, I just love the approach. It's so good, and text are marking the names of the blocks. Essentially, our teams set up along the edge of that blue marker line and systematically grid search. And the aim is that all terrain needs to be visually searched, so ultimately teams should be no more than five metres apart. In the sense of those guys lining up on the ground, the person at the end will have a string line which is deployed off a hip chain, and so all terrain can be re-measured and uh, traced. We're getting to the phase now that there's less weeds coming out, so you can't use the weeds to gauge where you've been. So hence that string line enables you to go all terrain through rocky slopes and all over the place. And essentially, if you're doing any weeding on Lord Howe Island, be that on ground, with a spray pack, on a rope or in a helicopter, it has to be grid searched systematic. Um, so we've got a number of weeds we're going for, and we also have to deal with the uh, migratory seabirds. We have a few different species which arrive at different times of the year. So it is a bit of a, yeah, seasonal approach. <coughs> and essentially how we monitor and measure our success, all hours of search effort undertaken in each landscape unit or weed block is measured or recorded. We break the plants that you remove down into life stages, so from seedling, juvenile to mature, 
that enables you to track change in population. If you keep on getting matures, you're obviously not doing enough work or the teams are not searching adequately or the technique's not working. And so another mode of monitoring that we employ is that as weeds reduce over time, and if you find an isolated mature, we actually GPS that and give it a unique identifier so that we can go out and search the um, seed bank. We apply a range of generic bush regeneration techniques as you do. Um, they're trialled on island before they're applied broadly. We have had some failure in treatments in the past, so we don't want that to happen. And some of our applications are technical to basic. <laughs> and when you're dealing with a island, there's lots of cliffs to negotiate. We have about 24 kilometres. This is an image from the Northern Hills where we have some fantastic infestations of ground asparagus, um, very crumbly geology. To do that on rope is very risky, if not expensive, so we've employed the use of a helicopter with a lance spray apparatus. Um, that's a little ripper. And so we rolled that out last year. We're doing it again this year. Um, the beauty about it is you can come straight up to the edge of the cliff and do targeted control, and you can do surveillance and control at the same time. So that's just been an uh, absolute cracker. And also, if you come out weeding on Lord Howe Island, we'll put a GPS unit on you. We want to know where you've been. There needs to be no guessing. This is in the sense of future-proofing the program. So whoever comes in, you can click on the GIS unit and go, all right, that's where the teams have been, no doubt about it. Some of our weeds are cherry guava. If it's in your garden, get rid of it. Don't trust it. It's a serious super, super weed. It's a low-light, uh, persisting species, once spread by pigs on Lord Howe Island, so it's good they're taken out of the ecosystem. This is what it used to look like on Lord Howe Island. Seriously, without cats, this is the cats on the hair back for a um, of weed species. Pretty much just a ghost town for guava these days in, in Lord Howe Island. There's hardly any in town. You have to sort of get out into the hills to find the relictual uh, matures, if not plants growing amongst Crofton weed. Um, chainsaws used to be part of the program and no longer, so it is positive forward movement. Um, yes, we've had it at elevation, we've invested resources to get onto those hot spots. Again, another weed you can't trust, ground asparagus, it loved Lord Howe Island and some of the after results and outliers in remote terrain. That's one of Hugh Patterson's mob, good on you guys, um, getting a groundy up above the lower road on Mount Lidgebird. And just understand, again, why we've targeted certain species. There was some high-level measuring and monitoring done in early in the day, back in 2002 and 3. We've now repeated that in 2013. So as you can see this map here, there's four blobs, four main landscape units which were surveyed for weeds. This map here, um, the one on the, that side, um, indicates sort of density of cherry guava of all life stages. It is largely containing mature plants. Just to understand how those blobs were generated, there's actually 760 survey points across that landscape unit and at each point a 12 metre diameter um, square plot done and weeds um, classified into different life stages again. So it's a very true representation of uh, distribution of guava back in the day. Uh, the other map shows change after effort and in that map that's largely sort of smaller range juvenile to shrub plants. Whoops, I've got to get on. And just to sort of also provide an additional measure in the sense of monitoring what we're doing, are we going ahead? This is an output from the weeds database which does marry to the results in that weed mapping. Okay, again, intermediate hill, another landscape unit, same story as before with uh, Lidgebird North. And then again, concurring with um, outputs from the weed database, nice downward trends. For eradication, you want to knock the matures out early. We've got a bit of a tail end, but that's how it is. I like using this for the community as to why we need to get rid of them out of the backyards because it's an island scale invader. The orange areas are the density mapping, the pink dots, unique individual plants removed. All those plants have been taken out largely though. Okay, and another good story with ground asparagus, transit hill um, map on the other side is mature plants, very residual matures. And again, just what it would look like if we did nothing, um, that sort of egg mass in the middle is Transit Hill that used to be a ground asparagus volcano. It's now referred to as Transformation Hill because <laughs> ground asparagus is really hard to find there these days. We're mopping up individual matures, juvenile plants. So our second top invasive weed on Lord Howe. Okay, program results. We have eradicated something, woohoo. Okay, even if we're limited in number, it's still a good claim. And so some of those species that we have eradicated is cat's claw creeper, wind-blown species. We don't want that blowing across the island. We also intercepted French broom, um, turkey rhubarb, tipuana tipu, just a few nasties out there. 
And as I mentioned, a few species are nearing eradication, limited in distribution. Overall, measuring where we've done our work and repeat visitations over time over the last 10 years, we've had an 80% measured reduction in weeds of all life stages. And then 90% reduction in matures. That's the key. Okay, so what have we achieved over the past 10 years? We've eradicated some things, we've reduced things, but ultimately what I see, the immediate threat of dense weed infestations has been abated. And we've improved the opportunity for the next decade to take it forward to more of an eradication opportunity. And we've trialled new techniques, such as the helicopter. And ultimately, improved program knowledge. I actually really appreciated the honesty with a lot of the talks here, learnings. I'm a big fan of that learning. If I don't learn, like, you know, why bother? And this program has certainly sort of taken on that. And this, this graph here, after 10 years of work, obviously you put it into a graph. It indicates accumulation of 25 weed species being removed or life stages in that orange line trending down. The bars indicate the numbers of hectares treated per year. Okay, that's been fluctuating. It's due to um, lessons learned, techniques maybe not working, changes in funding, but overall we've had a good downward trend. Ultimately, if I could crystal ball our needs many years ago, I'd be aiming for 500 hectares a year to drive a stronger trend, but I think overall we've done some pretty fantastic outcomes. There has been an astounding collective human effort and learning on Lord Howe Island. Um, in the sense, it is an itinerant place, people come and go, it's an amazing tourist destination for what it is. Um, we've had up to 750 friends of Lord Howe Island been involved in the program. Um, over the last 10 years, up to 150 volunteers imported to help do the work, up to 60 people employed. So there's been a lot of exchange of information and learning. And we've had significant investment, no doubt about that. It is a high end of town project, but when you're managing uh, UNESCO, World Heritage recognised ecosystems, outstanding universal values. You've got the issues with weeds or rodents. You've got to get in and give it a shot. You don't fudge around the size. It's like, okay, we're going to crack into this and uh, you know, help recover and build the res resilience of these ecosystems. And okay, money's one thing, the people on the ground are the other. So again, just want to um, thank all of our volunteers and all the board staff. We do have future, future challenges, as I mentioned. Weeds can get a bit sort of boring. It takes a bit of a lead in time. So eradication fatigue is something that we're trying to deal with. And that's from all stakeholders, guys on the ground, uh, project managers, <laughs> the board. And ultimately, the key for success is that all punters need to be aligned to the goal of eradication. You have to have dedication and belief in the project. Otherwise, you're not, your head's not going to be in the right space and you're not going to be applying yourself as efficiently on ground. And one thing that is going to be a real challenge and the people that have been doing eradications in New Zealand said that as weeds reduce, it becomes hard on the ground mentally. You've got less catch for effort. So the challenge is going to be for our teams and volunteers to really keep that focus to get that last weed. And obviously adapting to change and your weed incursions. Sustaining no local knowledge is important, but being a remote island, staying connected with other people like you guys. <laughs> and adopting international best practice. Um, Sometimes people don't consider Lord Howe to be part of the mainland. <laughs> so, and we do have a tour called Around the World Tour. So, and hence I'm sort of just putting out there internationally is maintaining connections with the mainland and also other island communities. And rugged terrain is definitely a future challenge for us. Funding shortfalls, but we just need to get smart about how we go about it. And we do have an amazing database which we do help track to uh, monitor our priorities in times of short money and protecting the investment. We're updating the strategy. Um, those photos are pretty quick there, but we're looking at new technology. That's herbicide ballistic technology, a pelletized herbicide shot from a helicopter. <laughs> and anyhow, and ultimately we're trying to brand the program and market it. As Hank mentioned, 16,000 tourists come to the island. People love Lord Howe Island. I'm sure they'd love to help take it to the future. And working with community, just to finally wrap up. Um, cherry guava was introduced back in the day as a source of food. It was a, quite a tasty plant and there's hardly any available in town at the moment. There's hardly any in gardens. So we've gone and bought fruit trees to residents to say a heartfelt thank you for giving up a fruit tree. We're giving you a fruit tree back. But also on the other hand, we're promoting a plant importation policy. There's actually quite a lot of plants that you can import which are safe for the island. And working with community again, and this is what we're trying to protect. Paradise, it's our five star. <laughs> and also just want to thank our funding sponsors.
and stuff. Thank you.